Robbie D and the lesson known. Oh my goodness, and welcome back to another episode of Robbie D and the Lesser Knowns. I'm your expert host, Robbie D. No applause? All right. Uh, What am I an expert at, you say? Well, I'm an expert at giving you the truth in a world that's full of so many crappy news outlets. It's nice to come to the one place where your ears can be massaged by the gentle fingertips of truth. Here I am to give it to you, and alongside me, as always, is Dr. Producer Will. Hello there. Very good. That's two words. I wasn't ready for that. I was only ready for one, but we got two. Fantastic. High five. Nailed it. Uh, Will is... Wearing a green shirt today, um, and he looks good. So we'll just give him. A, we'll leave it on that. But enough about this crap. We need to get to our guest today, who is in quite a few things: stellar athlete, Powerade commercial, junior national tennis champion multiple times, Division One professional athlete. <laughs> That's not the same thing. <laughs> <clears throat> Division One, former Division One athlete. And a bunch of movies, and don't forget the copper fit spokesman. You can see him running right now on TV. None other than the fabulous and the tall Oliver Morton. Hello, 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 hello. Thank you, gents. Thank you. Thank you. Oliver, it's a pleasure. If I may, real quick, just so people understand what's going on here, you are a big get for this show, mm-hmm. and I mean that literally. Mm-hmm. You're 6'9. Correct. 235. Correct. Uh, you barely fit in that chair. Just barely. We almost ordered a new chair for you. You uh, probably will after I'm done with it. Yeah. Yeah, that chair's it's not looking good. It's holding on for dear life. Um, yeah, we're, we'll, we'll put that on the list, producer. Will. we got to buy a new chair. Oh, yeah. On the list. <laughs> that was real typing, in case you're wondering. He really typed uh, fidget the, the ochre. The biggest, the biggest <laughs> fingers in the history of typing. <laughs> oh, man. Oliver. I'm going to start in a different spot than I usually do today. Tell me about your eating habits. Eating habits, also known as nutrition, as we like to call it. Um, so when I, pl- I played... You're already, you're already burning me this early in the yeah, show. I'm <laughs> burning you right off the bat. <laughs> All right. Gotta be, set, I got to set you straight sometimes. It's going to be a fun hour. Yes. Um, so yeah, I, I played junior national tennis. I played... Uh, I was a high school All-American basketball player. I was a Division One college athlete with basketball. Yeah, um, that's all nutrition you're talking about right now. Well, I'm getting ready to get into this. <laughs> and then I played professionally for eight years. And the point of that is uh, I did that without knowing anything about how our bodies process food. So five years ago, I started studying microbiology and how mitochondria and the inner workings of our digestive system work. So in doing that, I stumbled upon a, a nutrition plan diet, whatever you want to call it, called paleo which basically means if you can't pick it or you can't hunt it out in the wild, you do not eat it. So after three months of that, I I basically stripped down any kind of loose skin or fat that I had existing, which I had a lot. I'm an endomorph, which means I'm a naturally heavy guy. Um, Started sleeping better, started feeling better, got stronger, skin cleared up. So I have for five years pretty much been very, very strict on this. And as a result, I feel much better. Also, my 68-year-old mother started this four years ago and it has changed her life got her off all her medications and she's hiking 14 miles and in tennis leagues so i'm i'm a bit big advocate of controlling what you can control which you're probably going to hear me say that a lot (laughs) which the biggest thing in my life is how i feel and um that has to do mostly with nutrition so you did all this research all this studying what did you uh, get on the final exam there was no final exam the final exam is me feeling better. Oh, you mean you did all that reading for your own good? It's amazing. Yes. Still this nerd can kick your ass. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I'm not going to contest that. Um, it's fantastic. I think it's very impressive the way you eat. And I think, uh, being an athlete is two parts, especially as we get a little older not in the college days, but the running and the fitness part, obviously. And then, uh, you got to start eating right. And people do all that working out and then they go eat terrible food it just kind of you're going to stay right where you're at yes the famous words of sylvester stallone is you is what you eat and it's very true and you see athletes today having longer careers because what you put into your body is what you get out of it and again i love traveling i love seeing people and what i love to do is storytelling which is why i'm here with you right now 
And the longer that I can live, the more that I can do. So that's why I'm trying to take care of myself. And it's a daily, it's, it's every day, all day from when I wake up until I go to sleep. Yay or nay on these items. You ready? Coffee. Negative. Cheese. Negative. Beer. Negative. Wine. Negative. Butter. Nope. Grass fed's okay, but I don't eat it. Okay. Um, liver, mac and cheese. <laughs> no. Chow mein. Nope. Eggos. Nope. Uh, and see, this is what cigarettes. Mo- th- no, this Cig- is- <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, crack. Absolutely, yes. No, like but this steak and cigarette. Please. This is what most people do. They name stuff like they, like that, and you, all you're hearing is no. And if you hear no, it's not going to work. But if you look up what you can eat, mm-hmm. you're like wow, I can eat that. I can eat that. And again, this is about how you feel. Are you eating for your prolonged health, or are you eating for five or ten seconds of taste bud bliss? And you have to ask yourself this question every time you look at food. Is what I'm getting ready to put in my body, is that going to make me better? And is that going to help me achieve my goal? See that I am opting for the five seconds of bliss, which is why I get Doritos, Locos, Nachos, Tacos from Taco Bell, because they're really good. Which is fine. And it's all a choice. And if that's what you choose and you're happy with it, that's fine. I just don't feel good eating that stuff. You're inspiring me to live longer right now. I think I'm going to stop eating that. Uh, I'm going to go, I'm going to stick with the Taco Bell. It's Stop. about 20 minutes of bliss when you enjoy it's true. the Taco Bell. You can eat Locos it slow. Taco. And our sponsor, Fat Burger, was eaten just before no, the show. No, no. <laughs> we're still eating. We're still sponsored by Taco Bell, potentially. Uh, speaking of that, um, what? how much would we have to pay you to take a bite of a chalupa? How much would you have to pay me? Yeah, 10 bucks. I'm not, no, I'm not for sale. I would not. If you 50. gave me $100, I would not eat it. I promise you. 1000 Ten thousand. No, I will give you one hundred thousand dollars to eat an yes. entire chalupa. Yes. Yes. You just said you can't be bought. I was expecting to keep going. <laughs> All right, but he's not. If he said no to a hundred thousand, so eat a I'm also a business eat. person and a real estate investor. A <laughs> yeah. hundred thousand dollars will turn into half a million dollars in ten years and make me four thousand dollars a month for the rest of my life. Yes, I'll eat it for a hundred grand. All I'm right. pretty sure Gandhi would if I can eat yeah. a chalupa for a hundred thousand dollars. So let's let's just get off uh, talking about how delicious and warm and uh, affordably priced Taco Bell is. And uh, let's talk about, <laughs> what, was that too obvious? No, I love it. No, <laughs> okay. I just like to get off. <laughs> I'm just trying to, well, <laughs> that's because you're a pervert. Um, yes. So, uh, yeah, let's, just, let's stop talking about, let's just run from the border here and talk about something else. Um, let's go back to the beginning, though, Oliver. You're from Tennessee. I am. I'm from a little resort town called Gatlinburg, snuggled into the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. What makes it a resort town? What makes it a resort town is the Great Smoky Mountains National Park is there, which is the most visited national park in the nation by three times. There's 11 million people a year come through there to look at the national park. Even more than Yellowstone? Three times. What about Redwood Forest? Any one that you name, it's three times more. The the main reason is... Big Bend National Park. (laughs) Amazingly, three more times. Um, The reason of that is New York is a 12-hour drive away. Uh, Chicago is like a 10 hour drive. Miami is a 12 hour drive. New Orleans is a 10 hour drive. So 65 or 70% of the U S population is within 12 hour drive. That's a valid point. You people know what you're doing there in Tennessee. It's, it's kind of, we have 3,700 full-time residents and you have 11 million visitors a year. You have almost a million a month come through there. That's pretty solid. Yeah. And you have, well, so Dollywood's there. You have an $80 million Ripley's Aquarium. You have uh, the Titanic exhibit. You have a bunch of uh, music stuff. We have a hard rock. So, I mean, it's it's pretty commercialized. That's pretty solid. Bed, Bath & Beyond? Uh, no, that's in Knoxville, though. Um, uh, Jimmy Buffett's putting his Margaritaville Resort in Gatlinburg. <laughs> Those things suck. They do good t- tourists, though. It's, I'll give you that. <laughs> it's $50 million and bringing in 300 jobs, so that, that's a big deal. Damn, that's one hell of a bill. Yeah, it's a big one. Wow. So you started playing tennis when you were there. Uh, yeah, my parents played just uh, for fun, and we, they went to uh, Myrtle Beach and Hilton Head is where we all went to the beach. And they wanted to go play at Hilton Head, and the only way they could is to get their six-year-old son away from them for an hour, so they got me a lesson. And so this guy uh, gave me a lesson, and my parents came back, and this, the, the instructor said, I'd like to talk to you for a second. He says, I have no reason to tell you this, um, but you need to get your son involved with tennis. And they asked why, and he says... That was his first lesson, correct? And they said yes. And he goes, well, he's doing more things at six years old than most of my students at 10 are doing. I've had him for three years. 
So my parents took heeded the advice, and then I, I got a coach when I was uh, seven. And, uh, and when I was eight, you can start playing in organized tournaments. So I won my, I won my first tournament. Um, I won my first uh, Southern District tournament, and then I got a print sponsor, which what basically that what they do is they give you clothing and they give you rackets and they give you stuff and they they put your name on your stuff. Um, so at that point, I started playing nationally, and I had a national ranking from the age of nine until the age of fourteen. Um, I won the state tournament when I was ten, eleven, twelve, and fourteen. So um, I was invited to play junior Wimbledon. Junior, uh, the Junior U.S. Open. I was at Nick Voluntary's Tennis Academy for uh, a short time in the summer of, I think, 1991. Whoa, 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 whoa. Don't give away your age, man. I'll tell you my age. I'm not afraid of that. I am. Do you want, do you want how old I am? No. 58. Jesus. No, you look, my, you look my great. Name, my name's Oliver, but thank you. Oh, jeez. Uh, how tall was your dad? My dad was six foot five. How tell your mom? My mom is five nine. How the hell did you, did you... Fertilizer. Yeah, no, I believe it. Milk. I actually think, to be honest with you, I think I would have been taller uh, when I was 15, 14, and almost turning 15. I started lifting weights pretty heavy, um, and no one knew anything about how to lift properly. No one knew about nutrition, which we've already talked about, or stretching. So I was lifting heavy at a young age. Um, so I think if I wasn't doing all that heavy lifting, I would have probably been taller, mm-hmm. which I'm happy probably that I did because I don't want to be any taller than I am now being a, a quote unquote normal person because people don't think about uh, extremely tall guys have problems with doorways, ceiling fans, movie theaters, airplanes, vehicles, clothing. I mean, it, it's not but all not, peaches and cream, not dunking a basketball. Well, uh, when you stop playing, even when you're playing, it's not that big a deal, but when you stop playing, it's really not a big deal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Cause making layups is so fucking boring. <laughs> Still two points. Yeah. I love layups. I do too. Layups all day. <laughs> Dinner rolls, as we call them. In college, if you, well, I played in the SEC and it's pretty physical league. So a, a finger roll, when you just flip it up there, they call it a dinner roll because it gets served back to you. Mmm, <laughs> <laughs> dinner. That sounds good. Uh, speaking of that, you went to Ole Miss. Correct. I uh, decided to, at 16, I had to choose because I was spending, there, tennis is a four hour a day gig and basketball is an all season all year you know if you're serious about it it takes up a lot of time so i chose basketball because of my size and signed with Ole miss played with them for a season my coach transferred out so i then transferred to the university of tennessee chattanooga and finished their um uh finished my college career there okay do you like chattanooga love chattanooga yeah oxford's a beautiful place and i enjoyed it we won the sec west there uh but i i didn't want to be with a new coach that i wasn't familiar with so I went to UTC, signed with a coach that took them to the Sweet 16 the year I transferred in, and four days later he resigned and went to VCU. So I had a new coach that I didn't Shaka? know there. What's Just that? Just kidding. I said Shaka Smart, but yeah. that was a little – Yeah, That was a while ago. Yeah. Uh, not the point. Um, but, no, I enjoyed Chattanooga. Um, I have a, good, a bunch of good friends uh, there. Um, I had – a pretty good career there. I had some injuries, but I had this uh, single game high in the NCAA for seven years with 50 points. Um, that was pretty cool. That got me my first uh, international gig. Um, and then after Chattanooga, I played in 12 different countries, mostly in South America and Europe. Nice. Mm-hmm. That's really cool. I use it, it as an educational tool. I've, I went to Italy first, and if I would have stayed in that country, I would have had a quote-unquote career. But I wanted to travel, and I wanted to engulf myself into a different language, into a different culture every year. So I took pay cuts to bounce around. So I went from Italy to Finland to Sweden to England to Scotland to Germany to France to Uruguay to Argentina multiple times to, to Chile to Ecuador to Mexico to Puerto Rico to Dominica. I mean, I just, I just bounced you around. played but, basketball everywhere. Yeah. So I, And it, it, that was my education. I have a business management degree and a minor in finance. But my education was going overseas and r- really understanding how we're all so similar but in different cultures. Like everyone's pretty much the same. I've, I mean, Russia, I was just in recently doing a movie, which we'll probably talk about, and I was really apprehensive about that because what we all hear about Russia, I could not have had a better time. People were great. Uh, the place is clean. Moscow is amazing. St. Petersburg is now one of my favorite cities. So... It, my education is traveling, and I, I look forward to. Uh, I've been in 32 countries, 
So I try to be in a, I'm trying to keep up with one country for each age I'm on earth. So when I'm 90, I want to be in 90 different countries. Oh, what happens if you live to like 220? You're out. You're screwed. Well, 220? There's 220. There's 196 countries. 196 countries? Mm. Well, by the time I'm 220, there'll probably be 221 countries. Well, or there might be less. When I turn 197, I make a 197 <laughs> yeah. country. You can bet your sweet ass yeah. on I'm gonna that. I'm going to move out to the, the Indian Ocean and just build an island. <laughs> yeah. right Oliver's right land. I'm <laughs> <laughs> not doing 198. That's cool. No, but it's a big world, and, and I really enjoy going to different places. And I, I, I'm by myself. Like, I don't know anybody there. I'm getting picked up at an airport by somebody I don't know. I've got a flat apartment or condo in a place I'm not familiar with, eating food I'm not familiar with. And you just learn and adapt. Um, but I'm always very grateful to come back and get, get back into my country because we have something really good here that most of us take advantage because we've never been anywhere else. Yeah, I agree. So speaking of places you don't know, you wanted to move to L.A. I did. I did. So when I graduated college, I went to Italy to a camp in the summer, came back, and then I, I began to get offers um, in places like China, Turkey, and Russia. My father, um, who was my best friend, wasn't very comfortable with those situations because the week that I got back from Italy, 9-11 happened. So most everybody was apprehensive about going anywhere, to be honest with you, at that time, especially in the area I was at. So I decided, you know what, I'm just going to take this year off. I'm going to move to Los Angeles and start pursuing my dream of becoming an actor. So I packed my car up with 3200 and something dollars in my, to my name and drove I-40 from Knoxville, Tennessee, which is just where Gatlinburg's at, all the way basically to Los Angeles. Where'd you go? Um, again, this is, this is the thing about traveling. I was pretty well traveled at that age. I'd been, you know, as a junior national tennis player and playing college basketball, I'd been a lot of places, but I'd never been to LA, which was weird. Um, been to San Diego, played some tournaments there, but never been to LA. So the only place I really know because of the Jay Leno show was Burbank. <laughs> so... Uh, this is before we had any kind of, you know, navigation on our phones or anything. I had a map and I got on the 10 from the 40 and hit the 101 and pulled into Burbank. Uh, no, I, I no, nothing set up. Nothing set here. up. <laughs> nothing set up. And, and I, I was Burbank. rocking my 3,300 bucks, which I thought was going to have me going a long way. <laughs> so I, I literally drove right in the middle of town of Burbank, parked and walked through it, which there's not much there if you've ever been there. Um, cool little downtown area. And got back in my car and just blindly drove around and found this wonderful place called an extended stay where they rent you rooms by the week. So I rented my room for the week, which I think was 671. So you know, for those math majors, it left me about 2,500 bucks. Um, that very day, I unloaded my car and I wanted to go to Rodeo Drive. So I got on. Uh, Got on the the, 10, the 101 to the 405, came down, got off of uh, Wilshire, and made my way to Rodeo Drive. And I was driving south of Wilshire on Bedford, looking for a parking spot. Um, didn't know there was par public parking garages there's, anywhere. There's signs everywhere. Yeah. Well, I couldn't read. I'm from Tennessee. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, No, it's a symbol. as a car and a parking spot. <sighs> well, I, again, <laughs> I'm slow. I can't help it. This is why I'm an actor. Um no, so I'm, I'm looking for a parking spot, and this lady, uh, probably mid-50s, was, was walking around, so I rolled my window down. I said, ma'am, I'm from out of town. I just arrived. Can you tell me if I can park here? And she goes, I don't know, but you're going to meet my daughter. <laughs> it's like, okay. So I, she said, stay here. So I just stayed there, and um, uh, this, this girl came down, Jen, and she said, uh, my mom said to come down and meet you, and you're looking for a parking <laughs> spot. And I was like... Yeah, I didn't mean to disturb. She goes, well, well, here, here's my parking pass. Uh, park anywhere on the street and just you know, just come up here to this, this apartment when you're done and bring it back to me. And I'm like, okay. I didn't know that it was like a $550 parking pass you know, that they're handing me. Just, <laughs> I, mean, I could have no, just, just drove off and used that. it. Yeah, or whatever. You could have sold it on Craigslist for like yeah, $2,000. Whatever it was. But this was, this was 2002. So, so, okay, 3000 Okay, whatever it was. But anyway, so I, I took the parking pass, like the gentleman I am, and walked up and down Rodeo Drive and got my fix and came back and took it back to them. And Jen was in there, and we just started talking, and she asked where I'm from. And then her roommate came out, Shannon, 
who um, I befriended, and Shannon offered, uh, this was a Saturday, she offered on Sunday, if I had nothing to do, she would show me around. So I said, sure. So I came back Sunday, they gave me the parking pass, parked on Bedford, and Shannon got in the car with me and drove me from Beverly Hills to Hollywood to Palisades, Malibu, Santa Monica, and back. That was my first kind of tour. They, I, I came back that night and started talking. They asked where I'm staying. So I told them I'm staying at the extended stay in the luxurious Burbank area. And she said, why don't you move in here while you, until you find a place to stay? And it was a couch. So I literally lived on, I'm six foot nine, and I lived on their couch for six weeks. <laughs> um, How but, tall was the couch? Mm, probably six foot five. So I, <laughs> I was in a ball like I am most times. Um, I had a, but what was cool was I got some mail from, from some family back home and my zip code was 90210 for six weeks. <laughs> that, was, cool. that was always cool. So, um, from there i I worked my way into some basketball leagues at UCLA and started playing for Magic Johnson on his touring team. Then I found somebody actually here in Santa Monica around, around the corner that had a place that was looking for a roommate. Um, he actually let me stay free for a month cause he was a basketball fan and knew who I was. <laughs> from mm. college and then i think he let me stay for 500 dollars a month and i stayed for three months ran out of money went back to tennessee that was my very first uh i was here for four and a half months that was my first four and a half months here in la didn't look for an agent didn't look for a class mm. i arrived used i did get some contacts through basketball but Again, didn't know what I was doing. Thought I was just going to come out, show up, go out, maybe go out some nightclubs. Somebody see me and then sign me. Yeah. Didn't happen like that. No, and rarely does it. I don't know anyone that that's, that that's happened to. I've heard some people say they have some friends, but I know no one personally that that's happened to. No, it's we're more likely to get an agent at the basketball court. Someone correct brings out their agent to play or something than the, the nightclub. Correct. Getting an agent's somewhat difficult, which we can talk about later. But, you know, if you know someone that can give you a referral, that's the best way to get an agent. No, I want to talk about it now. Let's talk about it. No, I'm good. Um, <laughs> I'm bored now. Yeah. Nah, forget here? it. Well, I mean, you went back and then came back again? Yeah, well, I went back. And uh, at that point, I kind of stayed around and helped my father. He had an antique business. I was helping him while I was just training for basketball because I had no money. I had zero dollars. And then I proceeded to go overseas and, and uh, started to make a little bit of money in Europe. And played for four and a half months, uh, got, came back, went, went, came back to L.A. So what I would start doing was I would go overseas for three or four, five, six months, and then I'd come back to L.A. for two or three or four or five months, however long, until I got my next contract. So the money that I was spending, I was making overseas, I was looking at it as an investment here in L.A., even though I wasn't doing what I needed to be doing, which was get into a class, learn how to break down scenes, you know, get, get an improv class, get an ag agent representation, get on some self-submission sites. I didn't do any of that. I came out here, played some basketball, and just tried to network my way into getting a job, which did not work out. Mm -hmm. And um, how long did it take before you actually got an agent? When you, the very first time you came out here, how long from that first time till you got an agent? To be honest with you, I didn't I, get an agent for 10 years. Oh, really? 10 years. I, because of my situation with basketball, no one wanted to sign me with being here for three or four months and off yeah. three or four months. It was, it was difficult. I, I probably could have found one. I don't think I looked hard enough at that point. When I started doing this full time is when I, I acquired an agent pretty easily just because of the hustle that I put into it. I think we got to go Morgan Freeman now. You're in Los Angeles, and tragedy struck in the way of a wayward elbow to your face. As you sat there bleeding, you probably thought, oh me, oh my, my acting career is over. But you persevered. Please tell us the tale. I believe you're talking about when I got elbowed and bleeding all over my face. Is that what you're talking about? That's pretty much exactly what <laughs> Morgan Freeman just said. <laughs> Thanks, Morgan. So, yeah, this was uh, 2000 and I think this was late 04. Uh, 
I was I was in between basketball gigs. I had an apartment here in West LA with a good friend of mine. And on Tuesday mornings in Santa Monica, we would, a bunch of NBA guys and uh, overseas guys would get together and play. And there were usually really good runs, and it was just good for you know keeping your keeping your game honed and all that stuff. So I was playing in this, and I caught an elbow right over my eye, and the tissue exploded. It wasn't a laceration; the tissue actually exploded. Um, it was pretty gruesome. It wasn't wasn't fun. Uh, one of my good buddies uh, took me to a plastic surgeon. Thank goodness this happened here in L.A., where there's some good people to sew you up. I'm not a handsome guy, but we don't want zipper zipper uh, ties up on our forehead. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I got sewed up and there was some nerve damage. So the plastic surgeon recommended that I do not play basketball for six months because I could lose my sight possibly. Therefore, I didn't play basketball for six months and I was here in LA and had money problems again because money goes fast out here if you don't know. So I had a friend, I had one of my best friends actually from Tennessee um, I played basketball with and he had a job in New Orleans. So I decided to go there and kind of help him out a little bit and let my face recover. And three months into that, uh, he comes home and says, they're casting a basketball movie here. And I'm going to the audition. I didn't know if you wanted to. I said, sure. I didn't ask the name of the film. I didn't ask the name of the production. Didn't ask anything. I just went. There was literally thousands of people at this open call in New Orleans. And the name of this movie was Glory Road, which was a pretty pretty big basketball movie. It was a Bruckheimer production. I think the budget was $55 million. And so we started, uh, you know, you, you start, this, proce- this process was they wanted to see if you could play basketball first. <laughs> so um, obviously my basketball wasn't an issue. So uh, they took me straight out of like the first audition and threw me into some callbacks for one of the main characters. And I read and I read, and then they brought me in for a, a director's read, which was which was really cool. I've never done this, mind you. I've never been through a, any kind of audition <laughs> never process. Never auditioned once. No, never been through an audition process at all, ever, at any point. So obviously, uh, I was doing something right because they kept bringing me back. I think I read five times, and I did not get the main part on the Texas Western team. Mm. Um, they brought a guy in that was that was a seasoned actor. Um, it wasn't the lineup all African American? Is that the point of the movie? <laughs> Correct. Well, the starting the starting lineup was all all. That's why they oh, made the movie. There's whiteies on the team. Yeah, gotcha. Yeah. yeah. So I didn't get I didn't get the lead as one of those guys, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. So, um, but I did get uh, two 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 cool things. I got to be on two different teams in that movie. Actually, three. Um, I was on the Iowa team first. Um, re- you know, this is a SAG job. So they're paying you pretty good money um, to rehearse and to shoot. And then they bumped me from the Iowa team and put me on the Final Four team with the Kansas team, which is a more prominent place, as well as a high school all-star game where I, ha- I got to interact with Josh Lucas, which was the star of the film. So that was all inspiring to me because I, you know, I, this is what I've wanted to do since I was a little kid. So basketball actually brought me that opportunity and the elbow of the face brought me that opportunity because if I did not get injured, I would not have been in New Orleans. I would not have met the casting director and I would not have met a good friend of mine named Mike Fisher, which I have done some work for ever since. So that has been a 12-year relationship that came out of the movie. So while you were lying on the floor in the gym, bleeding, saying, oh me, oh my, little did you know ahead lay your first big success correct to correct you i wasn't lying on the floor i actually didn't fall down but I, blood were, was gushing out of my forehead you were standing inside the wall <laughs> yeah. remember his eye exploded yes. him backwards yeah i was actually standing blood was gushing and i was not happy because i knew two things it wasn't good because of the amount of blood coming out of my money so you start having negative thoughts um going to new orleans i you know i thought i was going to be working and not doing what i wanted to do which was acting but it turned into one of the biggest projects that i could ever imagine doing so um, I worked on that for, I think, three months, and that's where I got Taft Hartley, and I got my SAG card off that job. My first, my very first gig, I got my SAG card. <laughs> nice. That is a very unusual. People try very hard. Those elusive SAG cards. Yes. Yes. So that, that was a huge blessing in disguise, which was getting to understand the process of auditioning, 
getting onto a very big set and watching how it operates, watching people like gaffers, which I didn't know what a gaffer was at that point, and and producers and writers and script supervisors. It, just watching that whole process, I learned a lot, as well as meeting Mike Fisher, which um, is a big sports coordinator, a good friend of mine, which, again, I've I've worked with dozens upon dozens of times since then i've worked i've worked with fish i know you have i met you through fish actually i met you through fish everyone meets everyone through fish i met you guys through (laughs) yeah uh fish is big we should should make a note let's get fish on the show bringing in fish fish meister general (laughs) mike fisher will be here i'm sure he'd be so excited to do this show so i was in england i was in sheffield england playing for the sheffield sharks and wasn't a great situation. I was actually ready to make a change, and I got a call from Fish. And he needed some basketball players for this movie called Even Money. So I uh, notified my team that I was wanting to get a leave. So I left, came back here, and for, I think, two weeks I worked on that film. And, again, the worth of that was getting to work on set with Tim Roth, Forrest Whitaker, um, Kelsey Grammer, Kim Basinger, Danny DeVito. I mean, it was just loaded. And Nick Cannon is who I worked with mostly. And again, it was just a learning experience. Um, and yeah, I, 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 I try to learn something from everything I do. And on that set, uh, what I learned was patience. Yeah. There was a lot of waiting, sitting around <laughs> waiting, sitting around waiting. There wasn't that much waiting on Glory Road, I think, because there were just there's so much stuff going on, mm-hmm. but on even money, I learned hurry up and wait. Oh yeah, which is what you're going to learn out here is this is not as exciting as you think it is. <laughs> it's not, and I, I was getting. I think I might have got a little frustrated, even though I loved what I'm doing. But now I, you know, I'm not just a basketball player. I don't do basketball roles exclusively anymore. So if you're on set and you're working, you know, there's tons of stuff to be doing. You can better understand your scene, get to know your scene partner. Um, there's there's always something to do. Mm-hmm. Oh, there's a nice trailer with um. Remember, Tug Speedman needed TiVo in his contract for his trailer, so he could watch TV. <laughs> uh, that's kind of a real story because mm-hmm. you need something in there to do. Because sometimes you're sitting around for hours and hours reading a book. Correct. A lot of stuff you can do, not just sit there and wait. Correct. And reading, like this, is another thing that was valuable to me. I, I went to college on a on an athletic scholarship. I got my degree in a minor, um, which I'm proud of. I did not study. I di- literally have never read a book front to back until I started acting. Mm-hmm. Um, didn't know how to, like I knew, knew how to read, but I read word for word. I didn't read with story in mind. Mm-hmm. And literally now I read, I think I read at least a thousand pages a month of something, of a novel, of a finance book, of, a, of an acting book. Um, and it's just, it's really helped me, especially on set and you have a lot of time and I'm also doing a lot of writing. And if you can understand writing and if you can understand story, it's going to really help your acting. Do any of those books have pictures? No, actually. <laughs> Damn. I was Good really upset. Books. I read about a thousand pages a day of pictures. Comics. Memes. Comic books. Yes. No, I actually, Hulk. believe it or not, I actually do read. No, it's, and it sounds trivial and it sounds stupid and cliched, which I thought it was too. But again, if you can read with, we, we see things in pictures whether you know this or not, when you're reading something, you're seeing things in pictures. And this is a visual medium that we're in and trying to be an actor. So if you can actually start reading with that in mind and trying to trying to create a world in your head, whether it's a novel, whether, whatever it is, you can be a better storyteller. And this, this is why I'm a wordsmith on this show because I need to draw image in people. I know someone's sitting in their car in traffic listening to this podcast and I want them to, to not see the traffic, but to see... We'll still see the traffic technically, so they don't they don't wreck. But I want them to see what your words are doing, right? But um, uh, speaking of seeing things, let's move on real quick. <laughs> yes, I'm gonna, please. I'm going to show you this picture right now, and we're going to post it on our Facebook okay. page. Uh, you have <laughs> noticeably long hair. <laughs> uh, I, I'm just going to go ahead and say this. I could tell it was inspired by Antonio Banderas. It looks like you're holding a rosary in your hand. Is that what that is? <laughs> Is a cross? Yes, actually, yes. <laughs> he went full desperado. Yeah, and that was okay. So yes, that is in my hand. I had no thought of desperado when I was taking that headshot, but yes, that, do, that does look like. He might not have any conscious thoughts. Subconsciously, Your subconscious was going crazy. Where did this headshot come from, and why did you do it? That headshot is from 2008. 
and uh, I was playing in Argentina for uh, a couple seasons. <laughs> that does, if you had to say, what's a guy who's stuck in Argentina playing basketball look like? That'd be about what I draw. Yeah, <laughs> you no, gotta I, go I, to the Facebook page. I had always wanted long hair and didn't have the patience to deal with it because I thought it was, it was difficult. And playing overseas, you know, I, I didn't have to worry about a commercial agent. I didn't have a commercial agent at that time because most of them don't want you to have long hair unless you're trying to type yourself something because you need to be kind of clean cut. So I let it grow out. This guy, th- these people and um, like a bunch of players in Argentina had these samurai knots, which I thought was so cool. So I was like, mm-hmm. I'm going to grow my hair long. <laughs> so I grew it out long. And to be honest with you, I wish I could keep it like that. I like the long hair. Uh, actually, that's from originally. I fell in love with that from Antonio Banderas and Desperado. I can tell you exactly where it came from. Um, but no, yeah. it was it was actually easier than having short hair for me because my hair is kind of wavy, curly ish in some places. So if it's long like that, you just basically pull it back and not and let it dry and just let it fall. And like I said, check out the Instagram rdlk underscore podcast or our facebook page Robbie and lesser knowns we'll have that posted it'll be there and with your permission way. i and imagine absolutely no and again i i like change this is this goes back to uh living in different countries and deciding not to be in the same place i like change i like to change my appearance i like to change my location i like to change my thoughts i like to change everything i like it um one thing that hasn't changed is your level of talent might i add but that being Always said, low. it looks like, <laughs> which is why I'm here. Uh, uh, yes, you'd be doing many. You'd be you'd be doing WTF with Mark Maron yeah, if you were. This is the, this is the losers. <laughs> you're on a show that celebrates that we don't know who you are. They put no chalupas. Babies in a corner. If you could see me, babies in a corner. Um, I know you play a bad guy quite a bit, mm-hmm. and it's because you are quite menacing and intimidating in your stature. Mm-hmm. So let's run through a couple of these. <laughs> you were the Shadow Man. Correct. You were some sort of a wolf creature thing. Uh, you were Frankenstein. Frankenstein, yep. Um, I was Stitch Man and Killer Deal with Ian Zuring. Uh Whoa, what did you do there? That was, so on Awaken the Shadow Man, which I'm the Shadow Man, I'm the creature that lurks around, um, the Anthony Ferrante is the, was a producer on that, which he's the director of Sharknado. So him and Ian Zarian are big friends. So I'm one of Anthony's creature guys. Mm-hmm. So they did this VR short um, in which uh, I worked with Ian, and uh, it was it was pretty amazing. I was in, I think, three and a half hours of makeup every morning. Um, never done a VR because it's a different medium. They put a pole in the middle of the room with like 20 cameras on it, and you just – do your stuff and it and that's how the virtual reality comes because they film in 360 degrees um that short actually went to um a film festival in new york um did really well and then it won the montreal film festival i think it's called fantasia award um so it was pretty cool i think they're actually talking about making that into a tv series or or some other kind of film when you have um when you have all that makeup on, you said three hours in the chair. Yeah, that was mostly body sculpting stuff, and then I had a, I had like a, uh, they put some on my face and then in my teeth, uh, but and then I had a like a scarecrow mask on. But in other situations, like uh, I've been in a chair for four and a half hours where they're putting silicone and prosthetics on your face. It's see, this is the part that drives me nuts. I want mm-hmm. you to understand, not you, but you in the car <laughs> or uh, doing your jog, whatever you're doing, <laughs> to understand that these prosthetic things. To some people, maybe not you, but they suck. When they put that on your face, you can't touch it. You can't do anything. It's just stuck on your face forever. And I know Jim Carrey, when he did How the Grinch Stole Christmas, literally had to do Navy torture training uh, drills because he hated having that thing on his nose so much. But you can't take it off because you just, you just want to rip it off, but you can't. So he had literally had to find ways to calm his brain. And they brought in a guy that taught him how to deal with torture. <laughs> Because that's what that was. Everyone's different, and he had to go through that. I've not had to do that because I'm different. Because you're a man, I get it. No, I'm not saying that. Everyone, Literally, everyone's going to have a different path. And I guess I have always been intrigued with stuff like the Terminator and, and when I was little watching what, you know, back then there wasn't all this YouTube. You couldn't just watch everything. But what I saw was just fascinating. Michael Jackson videos, how they transformed him into Thriller. So sitting in a chair and watching and I've luckily worked with very, very, very good people. 
um, and watching the transformation transformation take place because all you're doing is sitting there. You're not having to do the work. Somebody else is doing all the work. You're mm-hmm. literally just sitting there. Um, the application is is fun and cool. It doesn't bother me. Taking it off, on the other hand, when it's wrapped around your eyelids is a little di- different. That's what hurts. The application does not hurt. Um, I know. Uh, I, would, for, I would feel relieved. I'm like, thank God. It's for off. Frankenstein, and then I did, a, I did a print job for Gucci, which was five and a half hours in a chair every morning. Um, but Frankenstein was four and a half hours, four, four and a half hours in the morning, and then 45 minutes of removal every day for weeks. Um, it gets redundant somewhat. But then you kind of get used to it. And this was face and arms up to my elbows every single day. So I had two people on me. Um, again, it's, it's fun because they usually have a mirror. So you can see, you know, they, they put the first prosthetic on. It looks goofy. Then they paint it. They put the second prosthetic on, paint it. And so it just it, it, you're, you're storytelling even though you don't think you are because it's telling a story just by putting it on. And once you get that on, doing your job is so much easier. It's, for me, it is because having that is, is like a character on itself. Like wardrobe and makeup make a big deal to me. Do you think that you can somehow backdoor your way into Sharknado 6 with Anthony? I asked about if I could be in the last one, but I didn't make it. But um, Number five? Five. But yeah, the one where they went. You'd be perfect for that. Well, the good news you could is be a shark. For all you Sharknado fans, they've kind of thrown a lot of the conventions out the window. So at the end of five, really anything, the door is wide open. The time travel element has been laid in place. Well, this is the lesser knowns, right? Mm-hmm. Sharknado, they want the knowns, so I, I'm not I'm not one of the knowns yet. Like I can get Ian Ziering on this show. He'll do it. Okay. I can. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll tell him to do it, and we'll see if he comes. If you, he's, he's, he's actually really, he was really cool to work with. I bet he'd do this show. He, 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 seemed, might, he seemed like the kind of guy. He might, he's really it, cool, and he was really all about his his kids. You know, he he was he was it was it was good to be again. I learned from all these guys. I learned from all of them, and what I learned about him was, um, just being down to earth. He ta- he'll talk to you for for however much time you want to talk to, and what we talked about most was his kids. And these people, most of the time, are just people that have lives outside of this that are just really good storytellers. Well, I think we'll get him on here. With your help, I'm going to have you give him a call. Cool. I don't have his number. I know. <laughs> well, we I can, a movie honestly, actually, I do have his number. We can actually find that. It's really not that hard. Uh, <laughs> you you want a phone number? I'll get you a phone number. He. What about he. Uh, Frankenstein? Did you have to wear... Um, <laughs> Do you like my New York Mafia phone get number? Get the hell out of here. <laughs> you want drugs? You're not getting your drugs, but I'll get you a phone number. Huh? You, phone you sounded number. like sounded like uh, uh, Hugh, Hugh Grant and Mickey Blue Eyes. Get the hell out of here. <laughs> well, you know what? You get a... Number. I'll write it on my Timberland sticker right up your ass. There's yeah. your fucking phone number. <laughs> oh, this show's going down. Um, it's yeah. never up. To be, I do have it. <laughs> well, to, to go it, down. Let me have it. I'm but, important. Uh, I'm does. important. Just so you guys know, he did show me Ian Ziering's phone number. 555 <laughs> <laughs> KLDM. All right. Um, what about uh, Frankenstein? You need to wear prosthetics for that? Yes. Frankenstein was um, four hours every morning. So call time is usually, for me, it was like 11. So I got into hair and makeup at 6 a.m. Yeah. And usually got offset around, we usually cut around 8 or 9 at night. So then I got off, I got offset around 10 because of removal. And then we were shooting in Malibu mostly, so I'd get back home at 11, eat, go to sleep, wake up at 5, be back for hair and makeup the next morning, or, or mostly just prosthetics. Did, did you, you have... Oh, what? I was going to say, could you sleep in the prosthetics chair? No. That's always something I'm curious about. Sleep? No, I can't. Well, yeah. first of all, you see how I am in this chair? Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm too big. Like, the they have great chairs, but, like, the back support goes to, like, my L4 and my lower back. So, you know, it was a good abdominal workout just sitting in the chair. That's actually just... Below the L3. Correct. <laughs> so, wow. you, you guys, have an acute sense for the audience. If you guys didn't know where that was, that's where it is. The, uh, uh, did you have any lines in that one? Or is that just sounds? Did it have any lines? I had some uh, some sounds because that was actually a silent film. That was set in the late um, 1800s, black and white, and it's silent, which is cool. They put what they did is, I forgot the word name for it, you probably know, is where you act something out and they'll put some uh, scripted dialogue on the screen and then go back to the scene. Yeah. So that that's the way and the trailer just came out by the way. Well, by the way, we'll have that one posted. We'll have that you posted. As well. <laughs> but we also have a surprise for you. Me and Will are going to recreate Frankenstein 
the live version where you get to have a line as Frankenstein. Mm-hmm. Roll the Frankenstein music. <laughs> and I'll be your co-partner, or your, your scene partner. Here we go. And Oh my God, I can't believe I'm here in the castle and no one's around me. It's just me. I'm all alone. Mm, me. Me with you. Wonderful. It's yeah. like I was and transported scene. away that into the laboratory. That was really good. Dr. That was great. I just stressful. saw that was stressful. bolt coming out of your neck. <laughs> it's great. Probably because you're looking at the picture. <laughs> <laughs> Is that a bolt in your neck? I'm just happy to see you. Uh, <sighs> damn. <laughs> I was hoping, I was hoping, I was hoping it was the bolt, all right? Oh, um, yeah. Nice. Um, so, athlete. Check. Mm-hmm. Actor. Check. There's only one thing left in your life to do. Breathe. But it's two things. <laughs> <laughs> and that's become a spokesman. Check. You're a spokesman now. I am a spokesman. And it's uh, airing, right? Um, there's there's at least one airing. So last year I began a job for Copper Fit. Is that your second sponsor now? Copper Fit? <laughs> no. But um, seriously, you'd probably feel a lot better in that chair if you had Copper Fit on your knees. Especially my back. The cool My knees and my back and the, my neck. The copper technology makes sure that your tendons stay nice and the, warm. The copper infused technology does help. I bathe in Copper Fit to give me my youthful glow. <laughs> I eat it for lunch. Sorry. At, at Patty's Irish Pub. Oh, that's a great shirt. Copper Fit's in all the beverages. <laughs> So, but you are an actual spokesman for Copperfit. We go am. on TV. You and Brett Favre. Favre, yeah. Um, so, yeah, I was contacted last uh, winter. This was a self submission, and any of you that are going to try to get into acting are going to learn about self submission sites because it's a way for you to try to get any kind of work without representation. Or if you have representation, this helps you on your own anyway. Um, so, I self submitted. I heard back from them, and then you. Then I sent in what is known as a self-tape, which you will get to know as well. That's where you go somewhere or self-tape yourself in your house or somewhere that looks decent. So I self-taped my uh, history of of basketball and sports, which I talked to you about. So they called me in for an in-person callback, and they booked me as one of their spokespersons. So last year I filmed... uh, where did, a Thousand Oaks. We filmed in Thousand Oaks, and that ran for three or four months, and then they called me back this year, which is a very cool thing. So this is my second year f- as being a spokesperson for CopperFit. And for, the, for those of you not familiar with Los Angeles uh, cities, Thousand Oaks is right next door to 999 Oaks. Correct. And right before... Hey, well, edit, edit that. We're not going to say that joke on <laughs> Stupid. <laughs> It was stupid. I like that joke a lot. That was one of my favorite jokes you made. <laughs> really? Cool. I really like that. Right, I love in. stupid jokes like that. Leave it in. Then. I'm going to make uh, a little moment, like possible edit. No, no. I, no, like, no. It. I like it too. No, we're going to leave all this in. Forget it. <laughs> um, can you can you remember your line from that? I love this commercial. From Copperfield? Yeah, I'd like to hear one. Um, in the spokesman yeah, voice. Like that my, my, last, my last line was uh, something like this. I've used this product, I've tested this product, I've bought this product. I don't, I be- I don't believe that. One mm. more time. So it's, I'm, you're saying I'm not going to get a third year? <laughs> Second year is the last one? No, no it's, it's okay. I so <laughs> I've used this product, I've tested this product, <laughs> I believe in this product. Go get, pro- go get Copper Fit and we can believe together. We can what? Believe together. Believe. You sound like you said bleed. bleed. I also did. Think I said you said bleed. Bit. We can bleed for it together. <laughs> for we brothers. will destroy L'Oreal. Braveheart. Copper <laughs> fit blood brothers. Uh, no, that was fantastic. No, what the, they actually do not give you any scripted lines. So you just kind of work on a story. And um, most of these commercials, what you'll learn is you just start, you, you, you tell your story over and over and over, and they just edit down to what they want. That's pretty cool. Mm-hmm. That's still pretty cool, though. Being a spokesman on anything is, is good. I'm I'm very happy. It's like being a spokesman, being able to book a role like that, and being able to talk to the camera, be natural and easy, is not easy to do. Yeah, and that's I think that's one thing about acting is like none of this is natural. You're creating something natural in an unnatural environment because there's like 15 to 50 people around you when you're doing something that's supposed to be natural, and that's not natural. So um, 
I try to be as genuine as possible. A lot of people pick someone to talk to. Um, I try to, like, if, if I'm doing a scene and I'm at a spokesperson gig or I'm doing a monologue, I try to ha- pick somebody's eyes out because I find if I'm talking to somebody, it's it's a lot more grounded and it's a lot more believable and it's a lot more genuine as opposed to uh, one of the most amazing things to me is green screen work. Oh, to be able to create a world out of nothing mm-hmm. and make it believable is is truly truly someone that's really talented. All right, so you've been in a boatload of commercials. Adidas, Nike, mm-hmm. Powerade, Adidas, <laughs> Powerade, <laughs> Nike, <laughs> Nike squared. A lot of the, a lot of the sports commercials. Um and it's not just from being talented and coincidence. What do you think the secret is to like getting back on set over and over again? It's a lot of the same people. Yeah, I mean, I think there's multiple things that go into it. I think this, there is some relationship building that goes into this. A lot of my commercial work comes from relationships with directors, casting directors, writers, producers that I know. Um, uh, and I think it's figuring yourself out. I think acting, a lot of people think it's performing. I think. For me, it's a lot less doing and a lot more being. So the more that you can be present, the more that you can feel something, the more that you can be with somebody instead of trying to do something and perform, I think it's going to be more genuine. And the more you do that, you're going to figure yourself out. And once you figure yourself out, you know who you are, you know what you want to talk about, you get a lot more comfortable in front of a camera. And obviously, the more rooms you go into, the more auditions you go to, it's just like anything else. It's reps, like an athlete. Just the more you shoot a jump shot, the more they're going to go in. The more you go into the room, the more you figure yourself out. You figure out that if you try to do something like someone else, it's already been done. Do it the way you're going to do it. Walk out and forget about it. If they like you, they like you. If you, they don't, they don't. And you can you just, again, control what you can control. Go in and be you. If that's not good enough, go to the next. So what do you think like the four most important things are? I mean, for me, being on set, again, the big mantra I use in everything in life, this comes from the nutrition you talked about, to the sports, to finance, to businesses, everything. Control what you can control. The only things that I found that I can control is being prepared. If you're going on set, you usually have a script. Know it. Know it inside and out. Not just what you're doing, what everyone's doing. So being prepared, being punctual. Something very simple that, that a lot of people are not in this town. Be on time. Producer Will is never on time. <laughs> no, I mean. Very rarely. No, yeah, I, was, I thought you were going to try and defend yourself. I was like, you. I am <laughs> obscenely early. I come from a military family and a business run family. And you might not have the best day. You might be down. You might not perform well. But one thing you can be is on time. And be respectful of others and not waste their time. So I'm obscenely early. Dude, nothing pisses me off more than people show up late and they're holding like a fresh Starbucks cup. I'm like, you're such a jerk. <laughs> <laughs> like, why? Like, you know, this wasn't producer Will either. This is no, just because I'm late. Here. I always go, oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I, so many times I have actors and actresses, male and female, show up. Like, oh, I'm sorry, I'm late. Uh, blah, blah. I'm like, that Starbucks is f- steaming, which means you got that on the way over here, which means you made a conscious choice to be late to this, yeah. and now you want me to be- give you more time. It's like, no. And it goes for everybody, no matter if you're an extra, if you're a co-star, a guest star, a principal, or, or whatever. Um, I was just recently on a commercial where there was 550 extras, and there was 19 of us that was principals. The main talent was five and a half hours late. They broke everybody for lunch to move outside to eat lunch, sat them down, the principal arrived, so no one ate lunch. They paid 550 people plus 19 principals meal penalties. So no one ate for 12 hours because this person was five hours late. What, what is a meal penalty now, 33? Something like that. Yeah. That adds a, up when you got it's a bunch of people. Oh, no, I'm just saying that's but just no, I mean, it's just $15,000. It's just respectful. I mean, it's just, it's, just, it's just respectful to everybody else. So punctuality is something that I control. Yeah. So again, being prepared is a big one. So time is money. Be prepared so you're not wasting time. Be punctual. Be professional. When you're on set, I, I like to watch everybody, but I stay out of people's way. When, when, when they call you, make sure you're not in the back, you're not talking so they don't have to send a PA to go get you. So I try to be around lurking, not in the way, but right there when they need me, you can step in. So being professional is a big deal. All right, so that's three Ps. Mm-hmm. The fourth one would be polite. Yeah. I am I am amazed in, in life in general. This goes through everything again in my life, which started with athletics, business, 
Um, and then out here, being polite takes so much less energy than being difficult. But yet a lot of people want to be difficult. If you're polite, again, directors, writers, producers, showrunners, everybody. Gaffers. You're on, you're, yeah, everybody. You're on set on a film for four to six, seven months with these people. So they want to be around somebody that they like, if at all possible. A lot of times the most talented people they don't like, and it makes it difficult being on set that long. So if you're polite, maybe if you're not as talented or known as somebody, you're going to get a job because they want to be around you. So again, those are the four things that I know I can control. So I control them. And that's the secret to being on set. And dang it, make a note. We're going to post that on Facebook. Prepared, punctual, professional, light. The four P's. The four P's. Oh. I need to copyright that, don't I? You should. That's uh, my book. That's you better hurry. Book. This episode's coming out in one week, so you better <laughs> get your butt to the copyright store. Uh, fantastic. So speaking, using the four P's, you booked a pretty awesome uh, movie that's coming out this summer. 2015 was kind of my first, outside of the basketball stuff with Glory Road and Even Money, um, my first like non-sports role is this film called Crime the Night. It was going to be filming in Montreal, Canada, and Quebec for two months in the summer of 2015. So I I agreed. Um, after I agreed, they said, oh, yeah, by the way, are you okay with us shaving your head every day? <laughs> I said, Sh- like, what do you mean shaving? I was like, they said, with a Bic razor, like, we're going to shave your head every day, bald. And at the time, I this, again, I was so excited to A, be one of the leading people in a movie and B to travel again. I'm getting married could go out of the country again. I'd been to Montreal before, but I got to see some different places and we filmed mostly around like Quebec, which is just beautiful. And I, I lived in a lake. So I was in water for, for two months, basically f- four or five hours a day. Um, so i got on the plane with the director, writer, producer flew there, got to better understand the story he wanted to tell with one of the other actors um, arrived on set, shaved my head the first day and did some makeup. It wasn't as extensive as what I've done now, but it was about 45 minutes every day, a little scar on my face. Um, and yeah, I mean, <laughs> threw me in the lake. Uh, it was about 53 degrees, which is cold water. I'm pretty much a fish, but, um, is that Celsius or Fahrenheit? Fahrenheit, I mean, which is in, cold. You're in Canada. You never know. Yeah. It was in the summer. Thank God. But yeah. it was still cold. Um, so yeah, I mean, that was my first real experience about having to prepare. It was a 120 page script and I had, I think I had 65 scenes. I mean, I had a lot, (laughs) there was a lot of stuff going on and I, you know, I mapped out an outline of all the scenes I was in and really studied like people with psychosis, psychotic killers and, and what was going on in their minds. So I could have a subcontext in my head because I didn't have a lot of dialogue, but I was on, I was in frame a lot. So I had to have, a, I had to tell a lot of story without saying anything, which in my mind is, is really difficult to do. But if you can do that right, it's really powerful. So I did a lot of studying. This was my first gig where I learned a lot um, because I got to apply what I was doing. I had a month and a half before we flew out. So I was basically just, just watching hours and hours of footage on like Ted Bundy. And, and people like that and trying to figure out were you watching that on the plane no I was watching this <laughs> Everyone's like, oh, the guy okay. sitting behind you is like uh, can we land in Minneapolis this Get me is off so this fascinating camp. isn't it don't you love don't you love dead Bundy no I mean literally so I wanted to, I wanted I wanted to better understand why they did what they did so I could have that in my mind and and what I, what I learned was from the majority of them was when they killed these people, they didn't want them to hurt like they hurt because they all had some kind of childhood thing where they were just in pain. And they were trying to end these people's pain because they didn't want them to go on and feel the hurt they felt. And that gave me a lot because I, I would have never thought that. You just mm. think these people are psychotic and you just go about your day and they're just killing people. So learning stuff like that and uh, trying to apply it and then being able to do that on film and then be able to watch the playback was was a big learning lesson for me. And I think it was a a big curve because after that I started to book more and I started to book more. And this is the reps we talked about. When you walk into a room, you get more comfortable. And on set, I started to understand how to use the camera to tell story. And that's what we're doing. 
learn <laughs> learn learn how you can do that heath ledger was the master of that he studied cameras like you wouldn't believe he was i mean he was a master he was no doubt a master but he was he knew how a camera worked he knew what he could do and what angles to do it to make mm-hmm. it look the best mm-hmm. on, to- on top of bringing being a great performance as well yeah and it's important i mean it's important to understand camera i mean i started to actually film myself with my phone a lot to know what this side of my face looked like what this side of my face looked like not trying to perform for it but just seeing what i looked like so i knew what kind of story i wanted to tell at angles and you use this knowledge to keep booking and you booked the number one movie in russia this summer yes i uh i was fortunate enough to be cast in a movie called going vertical um, which is also known as Three Seconds. Um, it's a story about the 1972 Olympic game, um, the gold medal game between the USSR at the time and Team USA, which we lost in a controversial Spoiler game. alert. Dang, man. Yeah, well, I think <laughs> most people seeing this movie is going to know what it's about, but <laughs> it hasn't been released here yet. It was released in Russia, I believe, on the 28th of December. Um, by the middle of January, it broke every box office record in Russian cinema history. So it's been a pretty wild ride for me since then on social media and all the, all the, uh, support for the film has been inspiring. It's, it's pretty much Russia's version of Miracle on Ice for us. Correct. Cause ever since basketball started in the 32 or 30, 36 Olympics, United States never lost a game except for 40 and 44 and World War II was going on. There were no Olympics. Uh, but other than that, they won every single game, I think 68-0, leading up to 1972. Correct. Correct. And Russia's coach had recently said, like, we're going to beat the USA. And uh, we said, eh, not going to happen, Cheech. So when this game actually happened, that's why it's a really big deal in Russia because it's a major upset. Yeah, and I didn't know much about it except for what most of us know about it. We were cheated. That's all that I, was, that I knew from the game. But when you start looking at it is we had 18 year olds or excuse me, you had 18 to 21 year olds that were going into the NBA. They hadn't played in the NBA together. None of them had played together before. They'd only practiced for a couple of weeks with a coach they didn't know. The Russian team had played 160 something games together. So if, if you play sports, you do realize that if you play with somebody a long time, you know their mannerisms, you know where they're going to move, you know where they're going to be. So it's a big deal. Um, and, you know, we just didn't play. If you watch the game, we didn't play well enough. They shot the ball better. They moved the ball better. We were a bunch of individuals, and they were a team. The ending was definitely controversial. There's, there's definitely something bad at the ending, but it never should have came down to that, ever. And you played Doug Collins. I played Doug Collins. Which TNT NBA analyst now and coach of the... He was a, a Bulls coach? Yeah, he coached oh, Michael wow. Jordan at the Chicago Bulls, and then he also coached him with the Washington Wizards. Um, Very never, storied basketball career, and you played the young version of him. Never got, Yeah, I never got to meet him or talk to him about it. Um, the, ca- the casting process was, 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 I think they had a problem finding a Doug Collins out here, which was uh, unusual to me. So I got a call from my manager, who is a friend of the producers. I put myself on tape. I went down to the Playa del Rey Park shot some basketball, dribbled some basketball, did a couple dunks, sent it in. And the next week I was called in for a callback in the Valley. And the next night I Skyped with a director um, of the film, uh, Anton, which he's amazing, uh, with a translator and decided that I was going to do the film. So I think six weeks later I flew to Moscow on July 4th. July 4th, 2016, I got on an airplane, flew 22 hours to Moscow through Zurich. Um, didn't know what to expect, a little apprehensive, even though I've traveled extensively in my life, um, and I could not have been more pleased. Uh, the, I think the budget on this film was $9.5 million. They're at $60 million now just in Russia and box office money. Um, the production was huge. I'd say it would, it would rival what I saw on Glory Road, which is a $55 million budget here. We had 250 extras every day. We had six cameras, spider cams, floor cams. Um, so the first day, you know, you're, you're nervous about what kind of story is going to be told. Is this going to be anti-USA? What have I got myself involved with? I, I've, that on the Skype session, I learned from Anton that this is not a political movie. This has nothing to do with it. It's, it's, it's just a movie about what happened. And the first scene, I was very anxious after we got done shooting the first scene, which was a locker room scene, to go watch playback. So I could see what this is going to look like. And uh, John Savage, which if you're a movie 
connoisseur, you know who John Savage is. He was in the Deer oh, Hunter and the oh, Godfather. Yeah. He was he was our coach, so he was in our first scene, and the playback was just, you know, I knew at that point. I didn't know how it was going to be received, but I knew it was going to have some serious cinematic value. It was just going to look really good. So uh, we shot for seven months in Moscow. Um, after we were done, I was planning on laying back over in Switzerland to see some friends in Europe, and I enjoyed myself so much in Russia that I canceled that plan and went to St. Petersburg by myself for seven weeks, seven days, not seven weeks. And, you know, I, I actually can't wait to go back. St. Petersburg, Russia is one of my favorite cities. To start of this podcast, I'm not going to lie, I didn't think that sentence would be said on this show. Mm -hmm. St. Petersburg is your favorite city. St. Petersburg is one of my top five cities in the world. It's a kind of a cross. If you've been to Paris, it's a cross between Paris, Venice because of the water and Prague. With the architecture, it's beautiful. That's a good mix. Yeah. So when when can we get the United States release? They are saying sometime this summer they're going to have an English subtitle version ready because ninety five to ninety seven percent of this movie is in Russian. I've seen the majority of it and it is amazing. There's a love story in the middle of it and there's also a story uh, involving the Russian coach that I didn't know about. That's one of the most heartwarming things you've ever seen. I can tell you if you want. No, 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 yeah. don't ruin it. No, but it's 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 actually. Uh, 45 minutes of the film is the, is what we shot that last game. It's a Damn. two hour and 15 minute movie and 45 minutes of it that last game. But there's two stories that are intertwined in the middle of that that are really good. I, I don't even need to know what they're saying. And that's what I love about storytelling. Um, and we actually, as an actor, I watch a lot of movies with no sound because what people are doing are more important than what people are saying a lot of times. I mean, I could say I love you, but if I'm not showing you, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying what I mean. The actions are more important. So the movie is really, really, really powerful. They do say that. If you can you can generally turn the, the audio off in movies and pretty much get a sense of what's going Absolutely. on. Absolutely. If they're doing it right. Acting, yeah. 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 That's, that's the key. Good acting. The key that you almost and, forgot to mention. and good directing, though. It also sure. comes down to camera angles. I mean, can, watch The Revenant. Leonardo DiCaprio probably had 10 lines in the whole movie. But he did do a lot of that. <laughs> Yeah, but I mean the Leo painstaking face he does in every movie. But how much storytelling was done there without saying anything? And it's one of the most to me that movie is one of the most powerful movies I've ever seen. I think the bear had more lines than he did. Yeah. So you know what you're doing, you know, we're, we're act. What is the definition of act? To put into action, not to say something. So what you're doing, what you're fighting for, is more important than what you're saying. Oliver, this is all fantastic news, but I got some bad news for you now. What's that? I feel like it's time for us to get into the most difficult segment you're ever going to be a part of. Oh. We call this segment Method Acting. All right, Oliver. Are you ready for this? Sure. You'd think you are, Probably but you're not. not. Yes. No one is. We, we installed the seatbelt on that chair. I suggest you go ahead and buckle in. Great. Wonderful sound effect. That was a real seatbelt. For those of you playing along at home, method acting is when I give Oliver a scenario and he must give me the line his character would say in this scenario. <laughs> Sounds easy, does it? Just watch or listen, whatever you're doing. Are you ready? Let's go. Scenario one. You just became the spokesman for the new Taco Bell fiery burrito. You must look at the TV and tell us how delicious it is. Oh, this fiery burrito is so delicious. It feels like fire in my loins. I'll take one. All right. One down, Oliver, but you're not out of the woods yet. Question two. Fabio walks into the room in 2008, and he looks at your hair and says... But that I can only be a one man with another hair. Au contraire, Fabio. There's two. And guess what? I'm taller than you. Oh, damn it. You're doing well, but answer me this question three. The plastic surgeon fixes your face after having a massive cut in it. He then offers you breast at half off.
Well, doctor, I really appreciate the offer. But how about some Voight basketballs for these testes? And I don't believe it, but you've survived method acting and you did it with flying colors, my friend. I am sweating. That was intense. I didn't think you were going to pull it out. But just like the USA in the last three seconds, I got cheated. In any case, that was fantastic, Oliver. I just have one more question for you. And this is a question I ask all my guests at the end of the show. No, I will not go out with you. Uh, Woohoo! Boom. Roasted. You're supposed to be on my side. <laughs> supposed to make fun of him with me. Anywho. Um, in all seriousness, I assist all my guests at the end. And that's what would Oliver Morton now tell Oliver Morton leaving Knoxville on the 40 to head to Burbank? Oliver Morton now would tell Oliver Morton leaving Tennessee for Burbank to one, be more realistic and to be better prepared. And what I mean by uh, realistic is this is not something where you're just going to come out here and be famous or be successful. If it happens, that's great, but don't plan on just getting in your car or getting in a plane or a bus or whatever you're going to do to get out here and three months later be a success. And there's different definitions of success. You know, are you wanting just to be famous? Are you wanting to be a movie star? Or are you wanting to be like a theatrical success as an actor, award-winning actor? So I think being defined, clearly defining what you want to be and setting out a bunch of goals of how you're going to get there is how you're going to be successful. Um, and being better prepared is I didn't get into an acting class until 10 years after I arrived out here. And I know a lot of people say, oh, I don't need an acting class. I don't need this. I find that to be very naive because an acting class isn't for you to learn what somebody's going to teach you. It's to learn about yourself. What's your blocks? Why, why can't you do this or why can't you do that? Because it's inside of you. That's why there's all movie genres. All of us are funny. All of us are quirky. All of us are violent. All of us are in love. Like we have all these things inside of us. And it's about being able to find those things and bring them to the surface for everyone to see. And that takes a lot of courage. And that's why I'm an actor. Wow, that should be the definition in Miriam Webster's dictionary. Actor. No, it's a fantastic answer. That's good advice for anyone listening. Oliver, I want to say muchos gracias for being on the show today. De nada. We had a great time. I hope you did too, but I'm not going to wait for your answer because I don't care. Uh, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for having me. It was a pleasure. <laughs> And no, I won't go out with you. Oh, geez. Well, then this show's been a waste. Anywho, <laughs> thanks for coming on, buddy. Always good to see you. We wish you success in all your auditions in the future. I hope you book everything you go out for. Uh, also, muchos gracias para los uh, verde camiseta. Perusa, Will. You're welcome. Uh, thank you for taking such great <laughs> notes. Pasiba in Russian. Pasiba. 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 And also, thank you to myself. I did a great job. Uh, I'm really proud of my performance. I think it was pretty good. So I'm happy with myself. Thank you, me. I was, yeah. I was pleasantly surprised. Good. Minus. Once again, That's I it. wasn't waiting for your responses. <laughs> I said it to myself. I'm good to go. We'll get you out of here on that. Guys, be sure to tune in next week when we're going to have our guest is going to be Anthony Ferrante from Sharknado 6. He's got a new movie coming out that may or may not be true. But the only one way to find out, and that's tune in, and we'll see you next time. This is Robbie D. and the Lesser Knowns. Check out our Instagram at rdlk underscore podcast. Find us on Facebook and on Twitter. We are Robbie D. and the Lesser Knowns. Until next time, we'll see you then. Robbie D. and the Lesser Knowns.